Toasties. I'm Missy, here with my bestie John Z. Hey, y'all. And welcome to our Toasted Shenanigans. Uh, what you got? Um, I've got a porter today instead of an IPA. I'm usually a big fan of those dark beers, so this one's by Founders Brewing. It's roasted coffee notes with graham cracker sweetness. Um, I definitely don't get the graham cracker, but the coffee notes are definitely there. I give it probably about oh, 6.5. It's pretty tasty. 6.5. Yeah. I would drink it again. I don't know if I would go out and buy it again. You want to try it? Kind of. You know I'm going to try it, even though I'm going to be like, yeah, you're not going to like it. It stinks. It's beer. It stinks. Oh, oh. <laughs> you know what it would be really good for? Cooking with. Yes, it would. Yeah, that's, yeah. That would be good to cook with. What you got? I got something new. I see that. <laughs> I am excited to try it. It's uh, Jack Daniels Tennessee Honey Lemonade. I love Honey Jack, so I'm actually really excited. So I'm, I'm hoping this is not disappointing because the, like, pre stuff can always be disappointing. Yeah. I've tried one of the, like, pre Jack Daniels ones. I can't remember which is one it was. Is it Jack and Coke cans? It may have been. I can't remember, honestly, but whatever it was, I didn't like it. Oh. Oh, it smells delicious. That's good. Is it? That's good. Yep. If it was ice cold on, sweet? like, a hot day. No. Like, ice cold on a hot day. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, well that, that's tasty. Yeah. That's going to be a summer, that's that's a summer drink. Yeah. That's a summer drink. For I like sure. that a lot. Surprised about that one. Because normally I don't really, I'm not a big fan of lemonade either. But that's pretty good. Yeah, I like lemonade. I like lemonade and I like Honey Jack. And this is carbonated, so that's, it's like a lemon soda with Honey Jack. Yeah, I definitely get the honey. Mm-hmm. I like it. It's I, very I, good. I, I will drink it still it. has the whiskey flavor. Like, they didn't lose it at all. No, not at all. And that I'm glad about. Because I do like that about it. I'd give that one a nine. Mm-hmm. That one's tasty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a, I'm excited. I'm excited about this. I would drink this all summer. Oh Lord, here we go. We're gonna have to find something else. No, guys, don't worry. <laughs> hey, I'm just glad I grabbed something different at the store today. It's very true. I walked past the barefoot Moscato, even though I stared at it. <laughs> I didn't even buy it for myself for later. <laughs> I was like, I gotta find something new. <laughs> gotta try something new. And then I saw this, and I'm like, it's somewhat new. <laughs> We'll see. Now you at least you found something new that you love. Yes. 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 So we can rotate now. There we go. <laughs> there we go. So what are, we, what are we talking about today, Missy? I am excited about this one. I've I've been I've been talking to you about this this topic for a while mm-hmm. about wanting to go over this story, and we talk a lot of crime on our on our channel here now. Mm-hmm. So this is going to touch on crime, as well as paranormal, and. Mm-hmm. A debated theory. Ooh, I love what's a good debate. And now we're talking about the one and only Amityville Horror. Ooh. ooh. Yes. We're going to talk a little bit about the horror, the murder, and the conspiracies behind all of it. Ooh. Yes. So buckle up, guys, for this doozy. I'm, yeah. Okay. I'm ready. All right. You ready? So... Uh, December 1975, George and Kathy Lutz purchased a home on 112 Ocean Avenue with their three children, Daniel, who was nine, Christopher, seven, and Melissa, five. <laughs> I told you, we're about to go, like, go right on back around. You're going to hear a lot of them. There's a lot of them. <clears throat> uh, George was actually their stepdad. That I did not know. I didn't know that either. Yeah, he was actually their stepdad. Uh, Kathy had the kids from a previous marriage, and George had adopted them. Okay. Now, that's there's one conspiracy is that her their biological dad died, but actually he did not die. The kids actually still spent time with their biological father. George just insisted on the adoption, which changed the kids' last names to Lutz. I wonder why. Oh, okay. <laughs> Picking up the signals. Got it. Keep yeah. going. Yeah. So they bought the home for only eighty grand. All right. 
which... That seems pretty reasonable for back then. It does, but it doesn't, being the fact that this was a three-story Dutch colonial home in, okay. a, in a very ups, upscale neighborhood. So they got off cheaper then. Mm-hmm. And they purchased the home with some of the furniture from the previous family that lived there. Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm always sketchy about that. Like I said, it was a beautiful home. But their stay there would only be 28 days long. What? Yes. Nuh-uh. Mm-hmm. Before they just up and left the home for good. I didn't realize it was that quick. Yeah. I didn't either. Holy shit. Okay. All right. I got, my, got me all interested now. So what caused this family of five to just up and leave this home is crazy. They left everything, reported leaving all of their possessions, including clothing in the closets and food in their fridge. Mm. Shortly after the Lutz family moved in, they started to experience paranormal activity that had them heading for the hills. Oh, boy. George said that he would wake up nearly every night at 3.15 a.m. When they say is the veil is the thinnest. Yeah, that is like the witching hour, yeah. they say. Mm-hmm. So every day, he would be up at that time. He'd also state he could never get warm in the house and rep- reporting numerous cold spots in the home. Even mm. even though the heat's on, they had a fireplace going, like he was never warm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the family reported odors in the house that would just come and go. Ew. Yeah. They didn't specify, like, what kind of odors that it was. It's just an odor. So, museum. When you say odor, I immediately go to bad. Like, if they said, like, smells, I'd be like, okay, it could have mm-hmm. been something pleasant. But odor, my immediate thought is that it's bad. Yeah, it's bad. And it was also reported that green slime would ooze out of the walls and keyholes. They would also hear doors open and slam shut. Even one time, the front door was ripped open and off its hinges by someone or something that they actually reported to the police. What the fuck? Yeah. The, um, they claim to also hear sounds of a phantom marching band at times. Ooh. Like, could you imagine that, though? Like, just being like... I'm just thinking of, like, high school marching bands and what that sounds like. That's loud. That's just yeah. loud. And, like, to just randomly, like, dead silence just hear that. I'd be like, what the... Oh. It would it be that loud or would it be faint? I'm I'm assuming it was probably, probably faint, faint, but right? still you're just hearing those it's it's just sound at that point then and it's just like where the hell is that coming from? Yeah, that's a little eerie. Okay. At times George noticed Kathy physically transform into an old woman. What? And one night he even woke to her levitating off their bed. Oh fuck no. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. I love you, but you take care. <laughs> I'll see you in the next lifetime. I don't know which part would freak me out more. Just be like looking at my, like looking at my significant other and all of a sudden they're transforming into like an old person or watching them levitate off the bed. Like, like transforming. Like, I can't even imagine like what that is, what that yeah, means. Like what, even witnessing that, like how would that come about? Like, like, is it like Animorphs or? Hey, yeah, those are good books. <laughs> they are. <laughs> but like, I'm just curious. He would also report hearing his children's bed slamming up and down, but claimed he couldn't do anything because an invisible force was paralyzing him. Mm. A knife was knocked down in the kitchen, and George reported a pig-like creature with red eyes stared down him and his son Daniel from a window. Yeah, no, I see why they moved out 28 days later. Yeah, no. George also reported Daniel and Christopher levitating together in their bed. Yeah, no. I, I'm pretty sure he regretted adopting this family. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Maybe. After countless paranormal activities, the Lutz family did have a priest come to bless the house. And allegedly, the priest heard a voice scream, Get out! And the priest told them to never sleep in that particular room. George claimed the priest felt an unseen hand slap him in that room. That room was the sewing room, which was apparently like this gorgeous, beautiful room. But Mm -hmm. for some odd reason, that was the room that the priest was like in. And that's where he had that that issue with this. 
entity. Yes. Um, and this apparently was the day that they had moved. Oh, okay. So after the, so they had the priest come and they moved the same day. What's the point of having the priest come then? Mm-hmm. Should have just stood outside and let him do work his like little, you know, magic and then left, not do it in the house and then continue to stay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Lutz family's paranormal tales is what spawned the cult classic that we know Amityville Horror. Mm-hmm. It has been made into books and documentaries and many, many films. Mm-hmm. And that is the story that we all know. But what is it that caused these paranormal activities, this house to seem so haunted? And this is, like I said, it was a large Dutch colonial with three stories. Why did it cost so cheap? And because of the family who owned it prior to the Lutz family, the DeFeos, 13 months prior... There was a murder. They didn't have to cl- dis- disclose that shit when talking to him. Sorry, guys, if I was really loud just then. No, they knew. They knew when they were given the price, the discounted price of the home, the Lutz knew that that was a murder scene home. They were the first family to move into that house after this murder had taken place. Okay. Which I believe in the movie, they even talk about how, like, it was a murder home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they they all knew that they were they were the first family to move in after this okay. this murder home. But that's the thing about the movie is we know the paranormals. Mm-hmm. We know the things that have happened to these to the Lutz family. Yeah, we don't know the prior story real well. No, who are the DeFeos? Fuck if I know, but I bet you come tell me. I am gonna come tell you guys. The DeFeos uh, was a fairly big family. There was Ronald Joseph also known as Big Ronnie DeFeo Sr. He was a handsome, slender man with powerful gaze. And then Louise Marie Baganti. She was a beautiful woman and wanted to be a model. But instead, after a brief courtship, Big Ronnie and Louise got married. And Louise's family did not approve of Big Ronnie. Mm -mm. So they cut all ties with her. Oh, shit. That's pretty serious. Mm-hmm. That's a little petty. Okay. That was up until September 26th of 1951, and that was when bit when Ronald Joseph Butch DeFeo Jr. was born. Growing up, Ronald had it hard being the first boy, and there was a lot of high expectations for him. Mm-hmm. Big Ronnie was not afraid to discipline him in the cruelest ways. Mm-hmm. And one minute they would be hugging, and the next Ronald is being thrown across a room. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, Louise's brother, Michael, said an incident once when Ronald was about two. They were sitting in the basement watching TV, and Ronald had done something. All of a sudden, Big Ronnie stood up and just pushed Ronald into a wall where he had banged his head or some part of his shoulder. He's two. Are you fucking kidding me? He's fucking two. Dirtbag. Big Ronnie was a dirtbag. Mm-hmm. That is absolutely right. And I can see why her parents did not approve of him. He's a, he's a douche. I'm kind of curious as to what she saw in him, but to each their own. Slender, handsome man. I guess so. Maybe he had some packing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Ronald was extremely overweight when he was younger. Until his later teens, and that is when he actually began using amphetamines. Oh, boy. Yeah. That that will alter a person. Yeah, his school life was hard. He was picked on for his weight, being called names like Blob, Bucky Beaver, and Pork Chop. <laughs> Bucky Beaver? And it's the 50s and, you know, early yeah, 60s. Yeah. Like, when I read these, I'm like, You're re- really? Like, that's the best you got? I've got nothing. I'm 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 behaving. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> like I mean, I'm going through like what the insults as kids when we were younger, and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to age myself and how we insulted ourselves. You know. No, don't do that, please. So he was not the son Big Ronnie wanted as a first son, but he, but still Ronald was at his side 
Mm. He okay. he worked for and with and alongside his father. I'm gonna apologize, guys, if you hear my paper rustle, and I still need to work on getting up at the times. Uh, Ronald did have other siblings whom he would take beatings for. Mm. So in July 29th, 1956, his sister Dawn was born. August 16th, 1961, Allison was born. September 4th, 1962, Mark was born. And at some time after Mark was born, for some reason, Louise left Big Ronnie. Mm. For just unclear reasons. There was no specific reason. Probably because he was a douche. Well, yeah. And I don't know if she, she took the kids with him or with her when she left him. I'm not sure. I would hope so. Like I said, there was just, it was unclear reasons. But to get Louise back, Big Ronnie, he was a gifted writer. So he co-wrote a song called The Real Thing. In 1963, jazz's great Joe Williams recorded the song for his album titled One is a Lonesome Number. And it worked. She came back. Oh, my God. Come on. I mean, are we surprised? Like, we still see this today. Yeah, I know. Okay. So, on October 24th, 1965, John was born. So, they have five children. Mm. There's Ronald, Dawn, Allison, Mark, and John. By this time, the family moved from their Brooklyn apartment to an affluent Long Island South Shore community of Amityville. The home on 112th Ocean Avenue was a lavish home and well out of the budget for a car dealer's service manager's salary. Mm. So it was like, how did he pay for this? Again, three-story luxury Dutch colonial Mm -hmm. home. So even then, it was, I mean, out of that that price for them. So I mean, I've seen pictures of that home. It's an attractive home. It's beautiful. Um, It was actually purchased with the help of his father-in-law. Louise's father. Okay. Big Ronnie also wanted life-size portraits of his family made so in early 1970s. Again, his father-in-law foot the $50,000 bill. For pictures? They were life-size portraits in gold frames. He wanted to immortalize his family with these photographs. And I believe they were painted. Oh, hell no. Yeah, this is the 70s and that cost a $50,000 $50,000 like today that would be no my my kids can like finger paint that shit I'm not paying that much for pictures <laughs> fuck that shit no and they hung in the staircase wall between the first and second floor and you want to know other fun things about uh, Louise's father hmm he had well connections and organized crime he was in the mob. I kind of got that impression when, like, as soon as you said Ronnie, like, my mind just went, you know, off to, well, like, its own little story you world. Got, you got DeFeo. Bag- yeah. Baganti. Like, mm-hmm. so. I kind of figured it was coming. Louise, Louise's father, so I think his, he was Mr. Baganti, mm-hmm. we'll call him, and Big Ronnie were part of the mob. So that's probably why her parents. Have money. Well, also her parents, like, disapprove mm-hmm. of Ronnie. I would assume so. On opposite ends of, yeah. Yeah, I would assume so. Uh, the father-in-law was more heavily connected than, than Big Ronnie was, though. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, So he, like, knew of him and didn't agree kind of situation. I think so. But then the grandkids, I think, is what brought them okay. around. Yeah. Because when when Ronald or Butch was born that's when her parents came around and was like okay fine and they're the reason that they have that gorgeous home to hold the Mm -hmm. whole family yeah and these life-size portraits in gold frames ronald at this point was heavy into his drinking and drugs which was a culture actually rampant at this time Mm -hmm. you know the early 70s like very rampant At this point, Big Ronnie's mental health was beginning to decline. He started becoming increasingly paranoid that his mob associates and his families were actually out to get him. That would just be me in general if I was in the mob. So I can see, like, with his substance abuse, it, it, like, making it ten times worse. I know. I, well, Big Ronnie, not Ronald. 
Yeah, but he probably still had some kind oh, of. Oh, I'm sure he totally did. Yeah. I'm sure he had something. Some it was kind never, of, yeah. This is something you yeah. can just run away from. I'm, well, it was, like I said, it was the 70s. It was, mm-hmm. That was, a, like they like I said, it was the culture. It was thriving. Yeah. It was massively thriving. But um, I'm sure he was totally into stuff. I'm sure that's probably how Ronald or Butch got into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The evening of November 12th, 1974, Big Ronnie launched into a tirade of physical and verbal abuse on his family which forced Louise to call Ronald home to help pacify his father, but not really realizing the hell that was going to follow. Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. The next day, November 13th, 1974, around 6 p.m., Ronald went back home after work. The door was locked, which he found odd, so he climbed into the window to stumble across the bloody scene. Mm-hmm. Which resulted him into running to Henry's bar, shouting, you got to help me. I think my mother and father have been shot. So naturally, a group of people followed him. Yeah. Running to the house. Um, Joe Yeswit made an emergency call to the police, and the residents of Amityville just watched swarms of police come to the home. They had all gathered outside, and they hoped that the children were okay. But one by one, watched the body bags being brought out. Mm. Six people dead in their beds, all shot with a thirty-five caliber lever action Marlin three six six C rifle. So, like, I'm imagining if I'm remembering correctly, and then obviously look up what this gun looks like. That's like the you pull the lever to cock it, right? That's what the lever a action bolt means? action. No, like you know how you're the talking BB about guns? the yeah the bottom yeah 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 yeah. That's insane. That has to be loud. Oh, yeah. It is loud. Apparently, nobody heard it. But they did hear the dog bark. Mm. Uh, it's a little suspicious, but... Yeah. So that's another one of those, like... Because I don't see how you could, with the way of working that, even try to, like, silence that a little bit. Yep. All found face down. The children received one shot while the parents received two. Mm. Mm -hmm. Evidence did show that Louise, the mother, and Allison were awake at the time of their deaths. Mm. Yeah. Homicide detectives said it was the largest number of victims in a single slaying on Long Island in recent memory. It's six people dead in one night. In Long Island? Are they for, for real? In Long Island? It's 1970s. Early 1970s. Oh, yeah, you I guess a lot that. of the like, crime around there didn't really pick up till the 80s. So, and okay. they lived in what was an affluent neighborhood. True, yeah. Okay. There was no sign of a struggle inside the home. And Ronald was actually taken to the police station for his own protection after suggesting to the police that the killings were carried out by a mob hitman named Lu- Louis Bellini. These names, man, I'm loving them. Lord... Was that a real person, or did he just make that up? No, it was a real person. Oh, God, why would he do that to himself? Well, the following day, Ronald confessed, and the alleged hitman actually had an alibi. Okay. He had said that once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. But why would he name somebody at this point? He's thinking enemies. He knows he's going to get caught and going going to prison with an enemy like Mm -hmm. that. Boy, you fucked up. Like, you fucked up. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know your grandfather has ties to the mob. Your father, and Ronald worked alongside his father. Mm-hmm. So you know the connections even your own father has. Mm-hmm. And you're going to drop in names like that? And when you know you're most likely going to go, like, if there's at this point, maybe there's like a 50-50. But you know you're going to prison. You don't want to make enemies right now. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Ronald was 23 at the time of the murder. I don't know why I always thought he was younger. Because that's, again, the movie made it seem like he was, like, some teenager. Like, some angry teen at his parents and family. But no, he's a grown-ass fucking man. Grown-ass man. Oh, what the fuck? I know. He's a grown-ass. He didn't even live at home. Wait, he didn't live at home? Mm Mm-mm. Supposedly. He wasn't even living at home. 
So he just happened to be there in the middle of the night? Was he just, like, staying the night or something? Or we don't know. We don't know yet. I'll go into a little bit more details, though. Oh, okay. So Dawn was 18, the oldest girl who was desperate to break free from her family to be at the boy she loved. Mm -hmm. Allison was 13 and was talented, smart, beautiful, and she had great determination about herself and had actually a close relationship with Ronald. Oh. Yeah. I thought that was all fucked up. Mark was 12. He was a football player, the athlete Big Ronnie wanted for a son. Mm Mm-hmm. Someone Ronald couldn't be. Oof. Yeah. John was only nine. Mm, I know. The youngest member of the family and loves spending summers in his pool and enjoying boating excursions with his siblings. Oh. Yeah. Bye-bye. Only to be shot by one of his siblings. Mm Mm-hmm. Ronald admitted he took a bath and redressed after the murders and detailed where he discarded crucial evidence such as blood-stained clothes, the rifle, and cartridge before going to work as usual. Oh, my God. I don't know why they ever attempt to just, like, try to live, like, a normal life after that. I don't know how you could. Fuck if I know, man. Especially, especially your own family. Right. Like, you didn't just take a human's life. You took your family's lives. Mm-hmm. All of them. Mm -hmm. And you're going into work the next day like it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing is I think what got him paranoid is he worked with his father. So it's going to look kind of fucking suspicious. suspicious Ronald, why are you here? Where's your dad? Yeah. I think he got paranoid. Yeah. Like, oh, oh shit. I didn't think this far. Yeah, I didn't think it through all the way. Yeah. So the murder weapon was found in Amityville Creek. Ooh, that was probably really loud. I'm sorry, guys. The trial began October 14th, 1975. So, like, a whole year later is when they finally had the trial. Probably because the media, I would assume. I think the media, um, I mean, they got him. He confessed, like, literally the next day. So, it's like, what's the rush at this point? Yeah, he's not going anywhere. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, in in the area, they probably had more to do than... Well, they said that, like, it was actually for them, they were... They were just quick to try to wrap things up. And I think they were uh, honestly doing, like, being, again, that high-end area, mm-hmm. doing damage control to let everyone know you're safe. Mm. Okay. It's 70, so it's not like they can quickly get on TikTok and be like, yo, you're safe. Yeah. They had to go out and actually make public appearances and let people physically mm-hmm. hear that they are okay. Yeah. So his defense lawyer, William Weber, mounted a affirmative defense of insanity. I don't know. You thought that through pretty well, though, bud. Stated, Ronald heard voices plotting against him that was his family and acted in self-defense. And this actually was supported by a psychiatrist named Dr. Daniel Schwartz. However, the plaintiff, psychiatrist, Dr. Harold Zolan, maintained that although Ronald was a user of heroin and LSD... Mm. He had antisocial personality disorder and was completely aware of his actions. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, that, that yeah, that's more likely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. you yep. paid the other dude. However, the movie, yes, mm-hmm. portrayed that he went crazy because voices, like he was possessed, like he was possessed, and that's why mm-hmm. he killed his family, which played into, yeah. The whole the whole story situation on the paranormal. Yes. So Judge Thomas Stark declared this the most heinous murder committed in Suffolk County since its founding. Oof. Yeah. November twenty first, nineteen seventy five, Ronald was found guilty on six counts of second degree murder. I don't know why Secondary? it was second. That's about to ha- like why it was second. I I saw that and I'm like second. Second. It must have been because coming for either were either way he's fucked. But no, well, yeah, but second, like that was no dude, plan that shit. It's definitely first degree murder. It was definitely premeditated. Yeah, you can't tell me it wasn't. No, he didn't just wake up one day and be like, "I'm gonna kill these people." No, motherfucker, planned that shit. 
Mm-hmm. No, he thought it through pretty well. Yeah. Um, December 4th, 1975, he was sentenced to six sentences of 25 to life. And it was held at Sullivan Correction Correctional Facility in Fallsburg, New York. Okay. His motives, again, remain unclear. However, he did ask how to collect his father's life insurance policy. <laughs> okay, maybe that's why. Mm-hmm. I think someone wanted a little bit of moolah. I mean, he is a drug addict. He was an alcoholic. He was mm-hmm. known by the... That's enough motive right there. He was known by the whole area about being this drug addict, alcoholic person. Yeah, so there's your motive. Yeah, but... After sentencing, though, however, Ronald all of a sudden gave several varying accounts of how these murders actually did happen. So it went from he did it all by himself to countless different stories. Why he didn't recant, why did you know, after or before all this, why he all of a sudden is like backtracking and making up new stories, I don't know. Did he appeal? Would that be asked for it? Or no, did he not make any appeals? Oh yeah, he did. Okay, but we'll get in. We'll get into that. There's, okay. The only thing is, is there's a lot. Like I said, again, there's a lot of conspiracies that have happened. And a lot of debating theories about this whole story, and that is also one of them. Okay. Uh, he did claim over and over again, "I loved my family," and in a weird, sick way, he probably did. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that him being sick with an addiction and the abuse that he received is an excuse. We mm-hmm. definitely say that with everybody. Just because you got these problems doesn't mean you go murking people. Yeah, no, it's no excuse. No excuse. People break the cycle all the time. Absolutely. But I do believe he did love his family. 1986, in an interview, he said Dawn actually is the one that killed their father. And his mother was distraught and killed the siblings before he then killed his mother. Yeah, I'm calling bullshit on that. Right? Mm -hmm. He said he took the blame for it in fear of his mother's father and his father's uncle so that they wouldn't kill him for talking negative about his mother. Now, here's the thing, dude. What what makes you think they they wouldn't kill you just for killing her? Yeah. And the family. So that makes no fucking sense no, whatsoever. No, it doesn't. No fucking sense whatsoever. They, you dropped a hitman's name. You now are saying that you didn't do it. You you took the blame for it so that if he would have told the truth that the mom did it, they would come kill you. No, you just killed that her and the family. So now that he's, they're going to kill you regardless. Yeah, no, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That one, when I read that one, I was like... That's kind of like Jerry and his stories. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, which I think he did have some social awkwardness. I mean, he was antisocial personality disorder, so I think he did yeah, have some he social. Definitely, yeah, yeah. So he claimed that he was married to Geraldine at the time, and her brother Richard went with him and could verify this story. So now he's dragging somebody else into it, kind of. Nineteen ninety, he filed for a four forty mo- motion to have his convictions vacated. He claimed again Dawn and an unknown assailant who fled before he could get a good look at him killed their parents and Dawn killed the siblings and then he killed Dawn by accident struggling over the rifle. Again, he said that he was married to Geraldine at the time and her brother Richard was with him and could verify the story. He was not married to Geraldine at the time. However, they did marry. They married in 1989. So he was in jail by this point. Yeah. And still got married. So some of you people, I just want to let you know, if you feel like you're never going to find somebody, if this motherfucker could find somebody while he's in jail for murdering his family, you if you haven't murdered a family, you are already better off than he is. Well, Bundy did it in his fucking court trial right there. Like, he just, like, hoodwinked the whole thing and yeah, married that one big fangirl. He totally did do that. So. Yeah, so anybody. You all got this. Love will find you. Yeah. Richard did not exist, though. She did not have a brother named Richard. What the fuck? 
because of all the changes in his stories and all the appeals mm-hmm. and or all the appeals, paroles, and any other things like that were all instantly declined forever. Yeah, because he's wasting people's money and time. And the same way with Jerry. Like, you can't keep doing this. You're wasting the state's money. Yeah, and they said, like, you're going to keep changing your story. You're going to keep doing this. You're going to keep doing that. Like, none of your stuff makes sense, dude. You're just fucking stupid. Yeah, you did this, and now you have to pay the, you know, why the bag you made. Right. So, in November, on November 30th, 2000, Ronald met with Rick Osuna or Osana. For supposedly six hours, which actually led to the book The Night of the Defe- the Night the DeFeos Died. Okay. But then Ronald claimed that actually he never spoke to this man, that he walked in, saw him, turned around, and walked out. But according to Rick, Ronald claimed him and Dawn and two friends, Augie De Janeiro and Bobby Kelsk Kelsky. Sorry committed the murders as an act of desperation because his parents were plotting to kill him. So there's another story. How many stories is he just going to keep making up? Uh, He keeps going. Dude is stupid. Mm Mm-hmm. It's all that LSD. Yeah. Ronald claimed his lawyer, William Weber, had persuaded the insanity defense against his wishes to drum up interest in a possible book or film deal. He said, quote, William Weber gave me no choice. He told me I had to do this. He told me there would be a lot of money from book rights and a movie. He would have me out in a couple of years, and I would come into all that money. The whole thing was a con except the crime. End quote. Mm. Now, that's an important bit of information. I just want to... Okay. I want to pin that one. All right. Ronald did die on March 12th, 2021 at the age of 69. For uh, They didn't specify, like, how, but he was in the hospital and died. Okay. So this is why the Lutz family got their home at such a discounted rate. Because it was a murdered home. The furniture belong to the DeFeos. That's creepy. Ew, that is creepy. I wonder if they have the life-size portraits in the house. Ooh. That's creepy. Like, yeah. I don't, I I know the house is still standing. Yes, it is. Correctly. There's just been a lot of additions to it. Not necessarily additions, and I'll get more into that as well. Okay. Yeah. So... Hmm. After they came out about the story of the paranormals, the Lutz family were hit with scrutiny and skepticism, and rightfully so. Mm-hmm. Now, this is where things get a little debatey. Okay. I'm ready for it. So you heard the Lutz story. Everybody knows the Lutz story. Correct. If you have not seen Amityville Horror, make sure you watch the 1970s version or 80s version. Do not watch Ryan Reynolds. Sorry, Ryan. But you got a 30 with Rotten Tomato. That says enough for me. Uh, it was not very well done. It was not. It was It was not. And that one actually was so far off on even what the Lutz family had said mm-hmm. that it was – that's why it's – don't watch it. If you – the one that in the 70s or 80s that came out was actually most – um most to the def- uh, the Lutz family's story. Okay. If you want to see their story. Uh, lots of their stories did not add up after being investigated. Okay. But they did do a lie, detest- a lie detector test, the Lutz, uh-huh. Kathy and George, and they actually passed. Oh. However, I am very skeptical of those lie detector tests at the same time. Because, yeah, that's why they're not allowed in court. Because I just feel like if you... There are people out there who believe a lie so much, it's truth to them. Mm-hmm. So if you're telling a lie with your whole body, because you yeah. believe it so much, it's going to show up as truth. Yeah, absolutely. So I really am very... I know people like to do those lie detector test things, and there's people who failed them. Mm-hmm. But if you're nervous, 
it's going to show up as, as it's going to show up because mm-hmm. it's based off a lot of that kind of readings. I mean, in my opinion, I just don't think that they're. No, they're not reliable. Accurate. No. So here's a really fun fact that I did not know about Mr. George Lutz. George was known for having a history of dabbling with the occult. Oh, was he now? Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the door also being ripped off that resulted them in calling the police. There's mm-hmm. actually no police report on that situation. Such but a liar. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of their claims have been proven wrong. Oop, I almost spilled my drink, guys. Oh shit. Um, the priest that was interviewed, um, that did the blessing of the house. Yeah. He was actually interviewed. Mm-hmm. In a show called In the Search, which aired October 4th of 1979. And he stated the Lutz family informed him about the murders and actually wanted to blast the house. However, the visit was supposedly the day they moved in. Which I guess it's, what? I guess in the movie, I can't remember. In the movie, it did say that that happened in the beginning of them moving in. Yeah, I do believe it does. Yes. So now I'm not sure which one is. The truth. Accurate or not, yeah. Exactly. Um, but he said it's not, it was not after. They were already there for some time. During the time, though, his story became shrouded or shrouded, sorry, in controversy after he contradicted himself with regarding to his involvement with the Lutz family. So even he was giving mixed stories when he was asked what was happening. It's like it was all just a jamboree together. Mm-hmm. Christopher, uh, the middle child, mm-hmm. uh, actually states there was no dead children running around the house because that was one of the things that was portrayed mm-hmm. in the films. And actually that photo of the boy, it was a photo of Amityville and there was like some, some ghost boy hanging mm-hmm. out the window, out the door, not the window. Um, George presented that photo after the movie came out, not beforehand. Mm. And there was actually a big paranormal slumber party that happened in the house. Okay. After the Lutz family came out with their paranormal stories because mm-hmm. they want they themselves wanted to be like, I want to see this paranormal. Yeah, they wanted to use it as a sideshow. They wanted to see it. They wanted to yeah. to test if they were actually telling the truth. And they did say that they had they had come across some paranormal stuff while they were in the home. Mm-hmm. But not to the ex- extent that they were saying. Correct. Um, but they, they did want to, um, evaluate the claims. Okay. The, sorry, I lost my spot for a moment there. The Lutz family later collaborated with an author, J. Anson, Mm -hmm. for his best-selling book, and they said that they never signed with him, but they ended up netting $300,000, and he is one that wrote the book about Amityville Horror. Which they sure w- do fucking lie a lot. Well, here's a here's a real, real fun thing. We keep going about it. Now, one thing that was truthful about the Lutz is their big struggles with finances. Oh, okay. They were in a very big financial bind. Daniel, who actually lives a really quiet life in the Queens right now, mm-hmm. claims that the house ruined his life and he still has nightmares. But he never denied the supernatural, but he also stated that George was very abusive and cruel. He states that George invited mysterious and dangerous forces into their life due to the interests of a cult. Okay. Makes you question some things. Yeah, Because I know it sure fucking made me question a lot of shit mm-hmm. when I was reading that. Christopher... Um, he did come forward in 2005 saying the Amityville Horror books and movies stretch the truth to the point of fiction. Mm. Now, these are the two, you know, the children. Yeah. Their minds are a little bit more there. He also states that George was obsessed with the occult and had exaggerated some paranormal inci- incidences he believed did occur when he was a child. So he does believe that there were some paranormal stuff but not, again, to the extent as what George is telling people. Total side note, guys, I'm pretty sure it's raining outside, and I'm pretty happy about it. (laughs) 
Christopher said, quote, he's a professional showman, in my opinion. I just feel as though we were being exploited. Remember William? Yeah. William Weber, who was Ronald's yeah. lawyer. He was also Kathy and George's lawyer at one point. Mm-hmm. And he actually came out in 1979 claiming that they made this whole story up about the paranormal activities over a bottle of wine. He, they were supposed to put this story together mm-hmm. shortly, you know, after Ronald's insanity plea. Remember how yeah. Ronald did claim that he was persuaded and said, you got to yeah. do this because they were going to make a book out of it and that's going to be famous and you're going to make money. Gotcha. Okay. See some ties there? That's yeah. the only truth that I saw in all of this, honestly, because it was spotted was it, in so many different ways. It was a money-making scheme. It was a... And it was starting to all connect the dots. Connect all the dots. Yeah. But the Lutz did not go with Ronald in the end for the story. They went with the other author. Or with Rob oh, um, William. so they were trying to get him out of it. They wanted more. Mm-hmm. Damn. So that is when William decided to come out and say... Yeah, we made this shit up together. Because he was already cut. Mm Mm-hmm. Because then here is the fun thing. Four other families have lived in that home since the Lutz family. Okay. Not one of them ever experienced any paranormal activity. Mm -mm -mm. So why would the Lutz family, but not anybody else? But I have my theory on that, which, like I said, I'll, I'll kind of get to in a, in a second here. Um, one of the owners of the home has actually changed the address since then because of the, the famousness of the of the house from the yeah. movie and mm-hmm. the films. The address has changed. However, it's not a secret. It's 108 Ocean Avenue, guys. But they also did alter the outside of the home. Okay. They changed the window styles. They've changed the colors of the house. Because they, they didn't want it to be associated with that anymore. Yeah. They wanted to finally rid it of that bullshit it is a very overdone story it's a very overdone story it's a very like you see the house and you're like amityville my aunt Mm -hmm. actually had a she lived in a house in um oh gosh i can't remember it was rapon or beaver dam back in wisconsin and that was the first thing we said about it it was a farmhouse Uh uh-huh like it was literally cows and corn were her neighbors but when we pulled up like, just the outside of the house were like, oh, it looked like Amityville. It's, it's the Amityville Horror House, except for it was two stories instead of three. But it just, you know, there's those homes mm-hmm. that you see that are spooky and they kind of have that shape and you're like, Amityville Horror House. Yep. Um, the home was last sold in February of 2017 for $605,000. Okay. Which was actually 200000 under asking. Oh, well, that's not good. Well, shit. That market, the market in 2017 was actually, it was a buyer's market for sure. Yeah. Bring it back. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> but again, none have ever reported um, any paranormal activity. None of the people have owned that home since the Lutz has That's ever reported anything. After reading between the lines, the demons weren't supernatural, but maybe George himself and may have been abusive enough to traumatize and terrify their family. Mm-hmm. My thing is, George was obsessed with the occult. Mm-hmm. Christopher even, or Daniel said, one of the boys said, that he has already invited negative, dangerous things into their life yeah. due to the obsession with the occult. Who is to say that that shit wasn't just fucking following the motherfucker? Yeah, because it's very rare that you find that these entities will attach themselves to places. They almost something of that, like that dark ent- entity will t- attach themselves to people. Yes. I think some people do think though that the that they do attach to places because the murder happened in the place so those souls are trapped. But they're not dark entities. No, they're lost souls. They're trying to get to the other side. Which literally they let you know what they need help with. Mm -hmm. They do. They'll tell you. I've had that experience. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you. Just lay some flowers out for them. 
give them their ceremony of the uh, at the they're home. They're just looking for some kind of acknowledgement yep. that they were left here. Yes. But a dark entity follows you. Yes, and wants to control, just like they did in their life. They want the control, and that's what brings them, you know. So my thing is, because they claim the story was that George also woke up at 3.15 in the morning. Mm-hmm. The murders happened at 3.30 in the morning. Okay. So they were tying that, oh, he was probably waking up at that time because that's when the murders happened. Mm-hmm. So they were really trying to tie the paranormal to the murder. So it was almost an Amityville murder to horror mm-hmm. story. But there was there was no ties, in George my opinion. George may, may have been a tormented soul, and that's the reason why he did what he did, but I don't believe the rest of them were, and I don't believe the house was haunted. I do not believe that the house was haunted. It is, it is the cult classic, mm-hmm. for sure. And honestly, in my opinion, again, the original movie is the best version of the story. However, at the end of the day, in my opinion, in this theory, it is that. Yeah. It is a story. But you know what's really crazy is they do say it's based on true events. Events, yes. I don't think any of it was true. There's also um, hoof prints, supposedly, um, in the snow that mm-hmm. they found outside their home. But there was actually no snow on the ground at the time that the Lutz family lived in the home. Though it was winter. It was it was not snowing at the time that these hoof prints mm-hmm. showed up on the snow. And that was another one of excuse me, one of their theories. Just a bunch of fucking liars. I I do believe that Kathy and George were strapped for cash. Yeah. They happened to know the lawyer for Butch or Ronald. And that they just I do believe that they came up with this they concocted the story. Yeah. I do believe that George was probably having some darkness follow him because of his occult you know ties and if you don't do that shit wisely you're going to fucking hurt yourself yes you will you and are, people around you you are going to hurt somebody you're going to hurt yourself you're going to hurt people around you you're going to bring in some negative fucking juju mm-hmm. you need to do it with a good open heart and it sounds like he was a cruel man to begin with like he he forced the the adoption idea apparently well the way he just kind of jumped into the situation makes me think that's how he handles all aspects of his life Mm -hmm. it's just jumping into shit versus thinking it carefully through so if you're doing that shit with all that you know that negative energy Mm -hmm. and not protecting yourself of course that's what's going to happen what did you think the outcome would be exactly exactly you gotta you you just you have to be careful you can't now if you don't believe in that kind of stuff that's cool for you but those of you who who do you know exactly what we're saying you yeah. gotta you gotta be clean mm-hmm. you gotta be good absolutely well that i like that thank you that's yeah. a good story yeah yeah i was like like i said i was a really i felt like it just really tapped into a little bit of everything because i did not know about george and his occult ties that i was did not either not once is that ever fucking mentioned. Kind of funny, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. Wonder why. Couldn't sell a story if you didn't mention that part. Because honestly, anybody who's like, well, motherfucker likes spirits. Who's to say he's not fucking drunk out of his mind? Because again, it's still the 70s. Yep. That shit's rampant. Yep. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for listening. That was, that was really good. Yeah, that was a lot of, that was a roller coaster. It was a roller coaster, in my opinion, because I—I I mean, I remember watching Amityville when I was when I was younger, and I was like, oh, "This is so scary." And my dad's just like, "Yeah, it's based off a true story. He killed his whole fucking family and blah blah blah." And I'm like, "Oh damn!" And then you're watching these paranormal things, and you're like, mm-hmm. "Holy shit!" And this I'm, actually happened. And oh then, my gosh! Then they come and find out. Oh shit! It didn't happen. They're just—they twist bunch it. of fucking crooks. They twisted a story. Yeah. I mean, Christopher seems to be the one who really outed him the most the middle child yeah he seemed to be out in george like no motherfucker's a liar i think daniel being again that older boy i think he was traumatized i think he was probably because he said again he was cruel and abusive just like big ronnie which ryan reynolds character in amityville was Mm -hmm. he was a dick um i think daniel probably got like the beatings just like 
Ronald mm-hmm. did. Yeah. I think he got life a little bit harder on him because he was, you know, the oldest son. Uh, nothing was ever mentioned about Melissa. And she was five. So I think she was just kind of... I mean, just chilling out. She had to go with the flow at this point. At that point, I think she was going with the flow. And honestly, I think she probably doesn't fucking remember a damn thing. Probably not. Maybe bits and pieces, but not well enough to say anything. Yeah. So nothing was ever brought up about her. But yeah, that's my story. Like I said, it's uh, it's the Amityville murders to horrors mm. to fucking lying bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that there was that much deviant work going on Neither behind did I. the story, but that's it's good to know now. Neither did I. When I wanted to just do, I honestly originally wanted to do just the DeFeo family mm-hmm. for this story. And once you get that ball rolling and going down that rabbit hole. Bro, that rabbit hole was open. <laughs> open. It was intense. And I was like, actually, that's when I stumbled on the whole lies. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wait, what the fuck? Yeah, so you've got to figure out, like, well, why would they want to lie about it? And it leads down. Yeah, it was it was just a, it was a tumbler effect because it was actually really kind of hard to find stuff about the DeFeo family because I was just like, who the fuck was the I family there for? I can imagine buried so in the sea of it Amityville. Was, yeah. Yes, it was buried. So having to dig that out and then having to go and dig, you know, when I was digging that out, is you, you dig more. You're digging and digging and digging. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thank you. That yeah. Very well done. Thank, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I was so nervous on how I was going to present that, so I'm glad. You did it beautifully. Because I, I was like, it. I hope this isn't too much of a roller coaster, because it was for me. And no, I'm not I, fell- e- I followed it easily. Not even going to lie, though. When I was writing this up, I I don't know what the heck I was opening up, but I was cold. <laughs> yeah. But you're cold most of the time. <coughs> colder than normal <coughs> yeah every little creak in the house started freaking me out i'm like shit <laughs> i'm gonna more, hi- more hyper aware of everything i was i was it, i was very hyper aware i'm like oh <laughs> all right thanks guys make sure you guys go follow us on facebook and tiktok because you never know when we're gonna be live which yeah we're be- about to go do one now yeah which by the time you hear this you already missed it so you gotta go follow us because we're doing it right now and it's and you you've already missed it shame on you how dare you go ahead unless you follow were, button unless you were there then hey guys <laughs> <laughs> make sure you guys are also following our facebook and instagrams and uh stay tuned because actually i'm trying to fix the facebook stuff yeah we've got some kinks guys <laughs> we, got, we got some and not more the, bad shenanigans i was gonna say not not the fun kind <laughs> you, you said kings not the fun kinds uh yeah so i'm trying to i'm trying to fix it all uh because when i first made it, it was just like a page and now i'm trying to make it its own thing so keep your eyes and ears and fingers aware for that when you're on your phones and yeah so thank you guys all so right, guys. much bye, bye.